as many of the northern CONUS offices are aware, um, it's really been a long, cold, and snowy winter uh, in this area. So here we are now. We're in early spring, and it seems like we just have not been able to break out of the, you know, the icy claws of uh, the polar vortex. John, if you could go to the next slide. Okay. So uh, anyway, I really can't take credit for this image. Um, I actually discovered this in a spotter talk that our WCM Jeff Last had prepared for our spring spotter training. And when I gave the spotter presentation uh, in a county to our west, um, I got quite a uh, roar from the, from the crowd when I showed them that. So I thought I'd include it in here as, uh, as an icebreaker. Yuck, yuck. So anyway, uh, next slide, John. Uh, spring and summer is eventually uh, arriving here, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we still got a rather elusive and sinister uh, different type of vortex that uh, we have to deal with. Uh, and this is something that we definitely had to deal with here in northeast Wisconsin uh, last August. Um, unfortunately, that occurred on uh, August 7th. Uh, Green Bay was really the next victim of an outbreak of QLCS uh, mesovortex tornadoes that raced across the, the southern part of our CWA. And it, uh, quite frankly, it took us by surprise. Um, uh, we probably were not well prepared, and before we knew what hit us, the system had rapidly raced eastward, uh, just about making it to Lake Michigan. So it, uh, we really, really struggled with this event for various factors, and uh, you know, we're still sort of beating ourselves up at uh, kind of the way the event evolved. But um, you know, talking to several other SUs at other offices, talking to Ron and others, uh, you know, we do get some consolation in knowing that we weren't the first, and we may not be the last WFO to, to get uh, taken to the woodshed, so to speak, uh, by these type of events. They're very challenging, uh, evolve very rapidly. So um, if you go to the next slide, John. The goal of this presentation is, is not to serve so much as a refresher, um, but really, uh, more importantly, as a reminder of the challenges associated with this type of event. So I'm hoping that after this presentation, you may have a better appreciation and maybe be uh, better able to anticipate and respond more appropriate, appropriately to these types of uh, rapidly evolving events. So uh, you can maybe consider as part of your uh, spring training if, you're, if your Sioux hasn't uh, already discussed the, this, uh, this type of uh, event, this type of uh, convective event. Next slide, please. So anyway, uh, we had six tornadoes that raced across the Fox Valley, and, and basically the Fox Valley is that area just south and west of Green Bay in the image there. Uh, we had six tornadoes that, that occurred during the early morning. Uh, next. Uh, and the first tornado developed around 1230 in the morning, and the last one dissipated around 1.10. So basically, we had six tornadoes occurring in about 45 minutes. Very rapid uh, evolution. Um, this was climatologically a very rare event for, for northeast Wisconsin. It was really the most early morning tornadoes we've had in this area since at least 1950. Um, as I said, this was a, tornadoes were associated with a quasi-linear system. And at, as the system moved across the Fox Valley south of Green Bay, it was accelerating to speeds uh, near 70 miles an hour. Um, we had uh, quite a bit of damage with this, but fortunately we only had two minor injuries, and I believe that was at a campground. So uh, after the damage surveys done by Jeff Laster, WCM, and myself, um, uh, pretty confident that the damage was confined to, uh, the most concentrated damage was confined to narrow paths that were associated with some of these mesofortices that we'll be talking about. So anyway, here's an image of uh, some of the damage. I should note in that image on the top there, it looks very impressive. Um, that's actually um, a, uh, called the Mirabel Caves. That's in northwest Manitowoc County. And that actually was a uh, freestanding structure. It's a very old building. I'm not sure how many uh, years old it, it is. But um, it was basically stone uh, mortared together. Uh, and when this uh, MCS, uh, QLCS, blew through there, it basically blew that wall down the adjacent wall is basically uh, the wall just collapsed backwards. So uh, it looks a little worse than actually it really was in terms of uh, the EF rating there. I believe we rated this this uh, final uh, tornado as, a, as an EF1. Next, please. Uh, as far as verification, if you can go to the, just hit, uh, OK. Bottom line here is um, we didn't do well when it came to the uh, tornado warnings here. Uh, we only really uh, hit one out of 14 total events. 
Um, so it, it was kind of ugly uh, from a verification standpoint. Next. <clears throat> so I'd like to just go over the synoptic and mesoscale setting kind of has, as it evolved during the evening prior to the event. So here's the 500 millibar analysis. Basically, you can see uh, kind of a strong uh, vortex up there uh, west of um, Hudson Bay, and we have a strong westerly flow over the western Great Lakes, some of those winds are approaching 60 knots. Next, please. I'm um, just illustrating here in the water vapor image. A um, couple of short waves were advancing through this flow. The one of uh, interest here is the one entering northwest Wisconsin at around 0Z. So this was the primary short wave uh, associated with this event. Um, rather uh, a strong upper level jet. This is at 4Z. Um, during the evening, this jet sort of settled southward um, and strengthened. And the uh, Green Bay forecast area ended up on the uh, left front quad of this, this upper jet. So you can see we have pretty decent uh, dynamics setting up over the forecast area during, as the evening evolved. Next, please. I'm um, just showing 850 millibars uh, from the wrap. Um, the uh, warm advection at 850, bottom line, a decent baroclinic zone across central Wisconsin, and decent warm advection occurring uh, at low levels. Next. Um, and associated with the jet and the warm advection, um, pretty decent uh, upward vertical motion across the forecast area. The, the models at this time were, were focusing more on the northern half of Wisconsin. Next, please. Um, again, as we saw in the analysis, uh, pretty strong 500 millibar winds pushing 60 knots over the uh, Green Bay uh, forecast area at 5Z. 5Z is about the time the QLCS was entering uh, the western part of our forecast area, and just prior to uh, when the uh, tornadic uh, mesovortices developed. Next. I'm um, just showing the uh, 0 0.6 kilometer bulk shear again, pretty darn strong, um, pushing 60 knots over, uh, over the Green Bay area. Next. More importantly, um, in these type of events, um, is a 0 0.3 kilometer shear. We'll talk more about this later. This is from the wrap. Um, bulk shear values, uh, uh, as uh, I'll show you later from uh, Schumann and Presbylinski and others, um, a numerical study suggests that uh, 15 meter per second or 30 knot threshold is uh, quite important uh, when you're trying to anticipate uh, mesovortex uh, evolution with, with an evolving uh, quasi-linear system. So you can see upstream of Green Bay, uh, 0 to 3 kilometer share was uh, increasing. Again, just looking at the lapse rates, uh, quite impressive really, uh, 7 to 7.5 degrees per kilometer uh, over the forecast area. Next. Um, 21Z, uh, interestingly, we had uh, um, a fairly decent uh, moisture discontinuity across the central Wisconsin from uh, west of Green Bay to around La Crosse, sort of transitioning into a, maybe a warm front there over uh, east of Minneapolis. So bottom line there, we had a, a, a decent uh, a boundary moisture discontinuity kind of situated across central Wisconsin, and that drifted northward during the course of the evening, became a little bit harder to identify um, as we decoupled during the evening, but um, you know, significant moisture grading across that, and that uh, was in the area as the system evolved. Next, please. Um, again, it's sort of showing the same thing as that uh, discontinuity drifted northward during the evening slowly. You can see how the moisture um, increased rather significantly during that five-hour period. Uh, dew points uh, west of Green Bay there, rising from the low to mid-50s into the uh, uh, middle 60s and even the upper 60s. Uh, over uh, just southwest of Green Bay there. That 72 dew point there is a little suspicious. Uh, I think that's probably uh, not representative of, of uh, the surrounding area, so I sort of ignored that 72 there. Next, please. Um, this is just the 0Z GRB sounding. Just kind of highlights some of the instability and shear parameters there. Uh, kind of focusing on the, the mixed layer cape uh, from the Green Bay sounding. Not particularly high, um, only about 670. 17 joules per kilogram or so. Um, note also the 0 to 3 kilometer shear around uh, 26 knots out of the west approximately. Close to that 30 knot threshold I talked about earlier. Um, deep layer shear was good and note the Corfiti, uh, Corfiti down shear um, vectors were uh, 285 at 71 and recall that this event was uh, propagating eastward close to 70 miles an hour. Next please. Um, this is just the wrap. ML cape at 5Z, again, just sort of illustrating 
you know, not a lot of instability, um, relatively low for, for late August, um, and a fair amount of convective inhibition appeared to be in place um, as well. And that convective inhibition and, and somewhat uh, low uh, CAPE um, had an influence on our forecaster's mindset as this event evolved, and I'll talk more about that later. Next, please. This is an interesting uh, uh, slide here. Basically, on the top three panels is the 0Z zero -Z HER. Um, as you go from left to right, it's, uh, we go from 2Z to the six-hour forecast. And the bottom three slides are the HER uh, two hours later for the same forecast time periods. And what is really quite interesting is how the HER um, sort of changes its tune and, and really shows a dramatic uh, change in the convective structure here with uh, considerably more mesoscale organization um, west and north of Green Bay. So uh, ra rather impressive. Next, please. So sort of summarize here uh, the synoptic mesoscale uh, situation here. The environment was uh, becoming increasingly supportive for MCS organization uh, as the evening progressed. Um, Large-scale forcing um, you know, helped to organize uh, you know, decent vertical motion associated with the low-level jet and the uh, upper-level jet. We had decent deep layer shear and uh, adequate 0 to 3 kilometer shear, again, which is important for uh, trying to anticipate these type of events. We had that boundary uh, to the west of Green Bay that was drifting north during the evening, and associated with that, uh, we had a relatively decent increase in, uh, of low-level moisture, um, which perhaps uh, maybe slowed the stabilizing effects of non nocturnal cooling during the evening. Um, overall, stability was, was uh, modest. Um, and so generally, I'd characterize this as sort of a moderate to high shear, low instability environment. Next, please. This chart I, uh, I got off uh, a web page on uh, St. Louis's website. Um, the reason I put this in here is just to sort of try to compare this event to other similar type QLC, QLCS events. Again, Ron is still uh, um, uh, looking at cases and is going to be updating this web page. I just wanted to see how this event compared to other Group 1 cases. What I mean by Group 1 is uh, these are, are uh, cases where a surface boundary is intersecting the northern portion of the convective line. And that was the situation that basically we were faced here um, as it moved into the Fox Valley. Um, basically, the uh, boxes in blue there just indicate those cases that were non-tornadic, but the tornadic ones, which is basically the, re the remainder, uh, basically suggest um, uh, greater 0 to 3 kilometer shear. Um, again, that's important for these type of events. Notice, too, that the CAPE, ML CAPE, is quite anomalous compared to at least these events. I assume most of these are summertime events. Um, uh, instability was not very impressive compared to some of these other ones. The Tulsa case there is one that Ron has talked about with me uh, in the past. It was uh, rather similar to the August 7th case in, in many respects. So I just threw that in there as a comparison as well. So as far as expectations, um, this is the SPC 20Z outlook. And basically, um, what the thinking was is uh, in the warm sector with that system out to the west, get, get a few isolated supercells evolving in the warm sector. The thinking was uh, later on in the evening, these would uh, perhaps gradually uh, congeal or evolve into uh, one or more convective systems, uh, possibly uh, producing some severe winds and hail later on in the evening. Next, please. And the updated 01Z hadn't changed that much at all. The thinking was similar. Um, you know, still thinking um, semi-discrete convection would uh, congeal uh, and merge into some uh, more organized convective line segments, which was the case here. Again, the thinking uh, maybe some bouts of severe hail and damaging winds as these uh, systems move into the, the GRB forecast area. Note, uh, again, the slight risk really hadn't changed much. Um, they did kind of edge the uh, 2% tornado risk uh, into a little bit further east into our CWA. And then uh, that just shows the verification there. Um, basically, west of Green Bay, you see all the blue dots. Pretty much there's the wind and hail, but then you have that little line, east-west line of uh, wind and tornadoes that uh, started west of Green Bay, and this event actually produced uh, additional wind damage over lower Michigan. Next, please. Um, again, uh, just this showing the 10:15 p.m. SPC uh, MCD. Um, just again, kind of highlighting what what the thinking was. They were certainly talking about um, uh, areas of convection congealing. You can kind of see that in the radar image on the upper right. Um, 
talking about coal pool organization and, and strengthening with uh, overall increase in, in coverage. Um, some of their concerns was um, uh, perhaps some diabetic uh, cooling, nocturnal cooling, which may have some influence on the uh, potential for wind damage, uh, though they do make the point that with the warm advection uh, and the moisture advection actually in the Fox Valley, that would slow that process. Um, okay, and then finally at, <laughs> at 1045, um, a watch was issued, a severe thunderstorm watch. I was not here during this, this event, but uh, uh, my understanding is uh, the expectations were um, you know, intermittent damaging winds, and as far as I, I'm aware, there was really no discussion of the possibility of tornadoes. Not to say that there, there should have been uh, necessarily, but um, uh, as far as I'm aware, that, that was not anticipated. Next, please. So this sort of summar summarizes what I, what I just talked about here. Um, so we can, uh, we can advance to the next one. So just kind of setting the table, and I, what I'm referring to here is sort of you know, our evening shift and, and kind of what we were thinking, what, we, what, uh, what our expectations were um, as the system evolved. And I think one of the factors there was perhaps, um, you know, we, under, uh, we uh, probably underestimated the degree of synoptic scale forcing um, that was uh, evolving over the forecast area. Again, that that uh, large-scale forcing, forcing helped to get those MCSs um, organized and help them congeal and, and, and develop further. So I think that may have been a potential factor here um, in terms of setting the stage for the, the warning decision person that came in on the midnight shift a little later. Next, please. Um, I thought this was an important point to make, and, and I talked with, a, you know, with our staff, and this is something that they, that they, they uh, mentioned and it's something you might want to consider too is um, I you know although SPC was talking about upscale growth and, and uh, congealing of MCSs and increased cold pool organization I don't really think that that really resonated with our forecasters I don't think they re perhaps fully understood the possible Im implications of of what what that could uh, generate um, so I, I you, can, you can see too in the animation that as you know, as SBC is talking about this, what our forecasters are, are noting is a general de decrease in the intensity uh, of the convection upstream. That was their perception. I mean, we were, we're uh, transitioning from uh, more discrete supercell type uh, convection to more uh, quasi-linear. Um, also, the reports of damage were, were uh, diminishing during this phase of organization. And I think that sort of uh, threw us a, a curveball to some extent. To some extent, and so uh, you know, our, our this decreasing trend or perception of a decreasing trend in intensity um, sort of reinforced our thinking that uh, the environment might have been a little too stable, and the severe wind threat would likely be be minimal. So, just to give you some insight on kind of what the thinking was there, um, I'm going to just let pause here for a second. This is a somewhat longer animation. I hope you can see that okay. Um, basically, it's showing the kind of evolution of the system. And we're going to talk about two phases of mesovortex development. Um, there actually were at least two, um, and those are indicated by the uh, rectangles there on, on the Wisconsin map. Um, there was a phase that developed upstream of Green Bay uh, between roughly 3 and 4Z or so, uh, between the Cross and Green Bay radars, and then the big event that evolved about an hour or so later um, just south of Green Bay, and that was the, the significant uh, tornadic event. Both of these episodes were associated with um, associated with the pivoting of a portion of the QLCS as the QLCS pivoted uh, to a more north-south orientation. Mesovortices developed. Um, this map is basically a very preliminary track of all the mesovortices that we were able to identify in radar. There probably are a couple more in there uh, I didn't include, but you get the basic idea. There, there are these two episodes: uh, one between four and five Z, and the one later on that was tornadic. Um, so very, very interesting. Um, I, I tried really hard to try to make some conclusions about why phase one was uh, not tornadic and phase two was. Ron uh, had to rein me in on several occasions to not to try to make any um, conclusions because, uh, unfortunately, that first uh, development of those mesovortices in episode one were, were pretty far from both radars, and we just did not have a good uh, ability to sample those mesovortices, so it was tough to make any conclusions. Number two, there were no damage surveys done uh, with that first phase. Um, we didn't get any reports of any uh, real damage with those uh, from EMs uh, and so on. 
Um, so uh, there really wasn't any, any uh, damage surveys done. So we, we had to be very careful about trying to draw any conclusions. Next, please. So um, before I can talk about the radar data, I, I, I could not do that without talking about uh, this uh, study that uh, uh, Jason Schumann and Ron Przybylinski um, have been doing. Um, and, and I'm not going to get into the details of this paper. I don't have time. But it's an excellent paper that proposes a three, uh, three coexisting ingredients which are believed to support an increased likelihood for QLCS mesovortex genesis and strong intensification. So what I tried to do here was uh, you know, just loosely try to apply some of these ingredients that are talked about in this paper. If, if your staff hasn't read this and you're in, in a part of the country where you, you are um, subject to these type of events, you, you really got to read this paper. And um, there's also a couple other papers I think are must-reads in this regard, and perhaps I can talk about that at the end. So anyway, the three ingredients here are um, the first one would be balance. And uh, I, most of you have probably seen this on several occasions. Um, what do we mean by balance? Well, basically, we're looking at a balance between the shear in the uh, ambient environment and the shear associated with the cold pool. If you have balance here, you uh, are likely to have uh, vertical updrafts, very erect, erect updrafts. And um, these erect updrafts um, are, um, lead to uh, rapid stretching of the vortex tube along the, uh, the leading edge of the QLCS. And again, I'll talk more about that. So balance is, is, is very important. You want to be able to try to identify that uh, in the radar data. Next, please. <clears throat> so just to follow that uh, a little bit further, um, if you read the paper by Schumann and Przybylinski, they talk about uh, indicators of balance. These are just a list of some of those. Um, the updraft, downdraft convergence zone, which I'll show you a little bit, is located on the immediate front edge of the vigorous convection in the QLCS. Um, Look for updrafts that are near, nearly vertical. Obviously, you would do that with an all tilt or a four panel or something like something like that. Um, these again, these vertical updrafts uh, uh, suggest uh, potential for vortex stretching. A strong reflectivity grading on the forward flank, um, echo tops uh, higher than surrounding convection, and and so on. Next, please. So the second ingredient they talk about in that paper is the zero to three kilometer line normal bulk shear. And, and again, I can't get into the details, but just remember the threshold, 15 meters per second or 30 knots. Uh, based on numerical studies and research by, by Ron and others, um, <clears throat> that value seems to be sort of the, the minimal threshold for um, uh, environments favorable for, uh, more favorable for QLCS uh, mesovortex development. The, in the image on the lower left there just shows a QLCS um, with the uh, zero to three kilometer shear vectors overlaid from the from the wrap, I believe, um, and what what the forecaster wants to look for is uh, first of all what's the magnitude. Um, obviously, these are uh, over 30 knots, 35 knots, and you want to look at their orientation. Are they parallel to the that line segment, or are they normal? The more normal they are, the greater likelihood that you're going to reach that line normal threreshold of 30 knots, and perhaps uh, and if the system starts to pivot. Uh, you might want to start thinking about uh, mesovortex uh, evolution. The third ingredient is the surge. Uh, look, uh, looking for trying to identify the rear and full jet, um, enhanced uh, surges, um, um, impinging on the forward uh, uh, flank of the QLCS. Um, the surge is important because um, it's, uh, it causes those vortex tubes on the leading edge of the, uh, of the uh, QLCS to um, be deformed upward. Uh, and uh, through this, uh, uh, as the surge you know, it sort of impinges on the front end of the, of the uh, QLCS, that forces an updraft and uh, helps develop these mesovortices. Um, and, as this, and also it also enhances the stretching along, along the uh, leading line. And uh, that stretching can be very, very rapid and very quick. And that's one of the challenges um, with these events is um, as this occurs, so you get very rapid uh, evolution, very rapid vortex development. Um, next, please. This is uh, basically showing the same thing uh, from some of the model, modeling studies um, from Atkins and, and St. Laurent, again, illustrating the importance of the rear end flow jet, um, uh, you know, pinching on the, on the forward flank of, of these systems. The dark black line uh, basically represents the cold pull. Um, again, the RIJ. Uh, impinging on the front 
leading edge of that and um, um, uh, leading to uh, rapid mesovortex development on, the, on that updraft, downdraft uh, convergence zone at the leading edge. Next, please. So this uh, basically shows then um, episode of one. Let's look at that. This is um, as the system is approaching the Green Bay forecast area between 2 and 5Z. Um, what we have during this stage is we have the MTS is congealing. Uh, the coal pool is continuing to organize and strengthen. We have the RIJ um, develops here, is present. And we see a portion of that QLCS indicated by the box, a um, portion of it starting to pivot more to a more north-south orientation and start to surge eastward. And this, again, was occurring uh, between the Green Bay and La Crosse radar. So it was, unfortunately, it wasn't in a good uh, area for us to sample um, uh, very well with, with the radar. Next, please. So as I mentioned, um, we did see weak mesovortices develop as this line pivoted north-south. Um, note there uh, in that lower right graphic that as this was occurring, um, there was another uh, portion of the QLCS north of Green Bay that was more outflow dominant um, that uh, dropped an outflow boundary. And uh, as the system evolved, that boundary ended up setting up shop um, just west and southwest of Green Bay. That may have been an important factor um, as to what evolved over the Green Bay forecast area a little bit later. Next, please. I'm going to pause for a moment because um, this is an animation basically showing the evolution of the QLCS, um, this portion of the QLCS um, during this phase. Again, this is uh, between about 345 and 430Z um, uh, upstream. And you can see very nicely um, a portion of that QLCS um, pivoting north-south and, and starting to surge eastward. And note, um, as the system is surging, we see mesovortices develop um, along that north-south uh, portion of the QLCS. This would be considered the balanced portion of, of, the, of the line, where you basically have uh, achieved balance between the shear in the cold pool and the environmental shear. So I think it's a very nice example of that. Next, OK, there we go. Yeah, and this, this indicates the, uh, again, just pointing out those uh, circulations that had developed. These were uh, not, didn't appear to be very strong. The, the southernmost one was really the strongest. That one was associated with some damage um, over north central Jackson County there. Um, as far as I, I'm aware, it was a straight line wind damage. Um, but, uh, and then there were additional weaker vortices that developed uh, to the north after the fact there. Um, again, note where those are uh, appearing in that portion of the QLCS uh, oriented north-south, suggesting balance. You can also kind of see in that uh, image on the right, uh, evidence of the rear inflow jet starting to impinge or is beginning to impinge on the system. Next, please. And we'll see that in the next slide. Well, actually, it'll be the one after this. You can go ahead to the next one, John. <clears throat> Again, um, this is just showing the, uh, the wrap zero to three kilometer shear vectors overlaid uh, on the radar data. Again, this is something you, you want to be you want to be thinking about. If you're, you're anticipating, uh, you know, cold pool organization, perhaps QLCS evolution, um, uh, you might want to start thinking about those that zero through kilometer shear and, and its forecast orientation and magnitude, and perhaps try to anticipate how the system may uh, orientate itself with respect to those shear vectors. Next, please. Uh, next. Okay, yeah, I wanted to get to this animation. Um, this just illustrates. Um, the evolution of that, that rear inflow jet during this phase. Again, the radar viewing angle was not uh, very favorable here, um, given it's north and east of La Crosse there and still quite far from the Green Bay radar. But I think even, even given that, if you look at the reflectivity data, you can clearly see um, the clearing of the reflectivity near the trailing edge and that inflow notch uh, evolving very nicely uh, at the back edge. Um, and again, as this is occurring, um, that portion of the MCS is, is pivoting north-south, and we're seeing uh, evolution of those mesovortices. Um, so v really pretty classic. Next, please. This box just indicates the portion of the line. Well, this is a portion of a line a little bit further uh, north from that uh, initial segment, uh, initial mesovortex uh, evolution. This is the portion of the line that surged a little bit later very, very rapidly, and, and this is the portion of the line that um, moved into the forecast, Green Bay forecast area and generated the tornadic 
mesovortices. So you can start to see that process starting to occur at this time. Next, please. So just to kind of summarize this, this initial phase here, um, again, uh, this is occurring between the Green Bay and La Crosse radars, uh, relatively poor sampling, so we couldn't make a lot of conclusions about the intensity, depth of these, of these circulations. But they were there, but they, they appeared to be relatively weak, but um, we don't know for sure. Um, again, uh, to that point, um, anything beyond 50 nautical miles, it's very difficult to, um, to uh, evaluate the evolution and structure of these. It appeared that the line seg segment was balanced, as I, as I talked about, and those mesovortices formed and remained anchored to the leading updraft-downdraft convergence zone. Again, indication of balance. The, after the initial MV formation, that first one that formed, uh, we noted that the additional MVs formed to the north of the initial one. And that happened in the uh, next phase that I'll show you later. Similar evolution. Um, there are only a handful of damage reports, as I mentioned, with this first phase. It appeared that most of the damage was with that very first mesovortex that developed. Um, but really important to note here that there were no formal damage surveys conducted at all, so we can't make, we don't know for sure if there may have been additional damage or perhaps maybe a weak tornado occurred there. We, we, we just, we don't know for sure. Next, please. So just to talk a little bit about situational awareness, um, during this phase that you're seeing here in this animation, it's around 4, 4.30Z, and our midnight shift is, is, is arriving and has just arrived at the station. And, um, you know, he, he comes in, um, very little time to get briefed as the, you know, the uh, current shift is, you know, getting the watch information out and updating the grids and so on based on the watch. Um, you know, the, the staff that we had there was just the regular evening shift. We're pretty busy, so he uh, just bellies up to the radar, um, realizes he, he, you know, he's seen, seen what's evolving here and, and um, the warning decision maker um, for this part of the event. Um, and as, this, as he's doing that, um, he's, he's not aware. Um, he was not aware of what was evolving upstream. Um, wasn't aware of those uh, that weak mesovortices that were developing upstream. Note that during that time period, those mesovortices were also becoming obscured by range folding. So that hindered his ability to, um, to note those, um, for starters. Again, the radar sampling was not, was not good. And also, um, uh, did not note that uh, outflow dominant portion of the QLCS uh, further to the east is starting to uh, sending out an outflow boundary out ahead of that. These are important evolutions that um, uh, he wasn't able to uh, identify just due to the, the fact he just got on shift. These are kind of happening rapidly. So uh, our situational awareness was not very good, and we just did not really note these important evolutions. And again, of course, the RIJ is present, uh, as, as we talked about. Next, please. So um, just to summarize that point again, our initial focus um, during this phase was uh, the marginally severe storms over the northern part of the CWA. As you saw earlier, there was some uh, convection that was uh, already into the northern and central part of our CWA. Um, they were, were not severe, but uh, we had to start watching those as they were strengthening. So initially, the evening shift was, was focused on those. Uh, then the uh, midnight shift comes in and assumes uh, warning decision responsibility for the southern portion of the forecast area and is not aware of those uh, upstream evolutions, which uh, unfortunately uh, uh, hurt us uh, as things evolve a little later on. Next, please. Okay, so to summarize that, um, again, not aware of the initial mesovortices forming upstream. They became obscured by range folding. Um, the line segment starts this, uh, further north begins to surge in response to that rear info jet. Um, that outflow dominant portion of the QLCS further to the northeast is driving a boundary southward ahead of the surging uh, portion of the QLCS. Um, also at this time, no recent reports of severe weather for the last hour or so. And this unfortunately reinforced our perception that, well, that the low level uh, nocturnal stabilization was, was probably continuing and that we're probably just going to see a minimal severe straight line wind threat basically. So that's kind of the thinking. Um, you know, as he's sitting in front of the radar ready, ready to go. Next. And because of that perception, we, we don't call for extra help. Uh, we just basically go with the staff that is there. The evening shift, of course, stays over 
to help out, but we didn't call anyone extra due to our perceptions and the time of night. Um, you know, kind of sort of reluctance to maybe call somebody else in given a perceived minimal severe threat. Next, please. <clears throat> so let's get into the next phase here. This is the, you know, the, the big event here. And again, this is a, a relatively long animation. Um, this is focusing on, on the, the portion of the QLCS that uh, raced across our, our forecast area there south of Green Bay. And again, you can see that portion of the line rapidly surging eastward across the forecast area roughly between about 5Z and about 630 or 7Z here. So we'll talk about this evolution next. Next, please. Again, just a three panel still slides here showing that evolution. Again, at, at this time between 5 and 7Z, um, we have a mature RI, RIJ um, uh, with this system. We note the second line surge occurring just to the north of the previous one I talked about. And the surge is occurring just south of that east-west thunderstorm offflow boundary that I talked about earlier. And again, as the system surges and starts to pivot, again, we see M uh, mesovortex development occur. Um, and this occurred roughly between that, the bow apex and that boundary, that east-west boundary. That was roughly about a 30 or 40 mile corridor in which all, this was, all these mesovortices uh, developed, particularly the tornadic ones. These MVs, in this case, intensified very rapidly and became tornadic very quickly. And also, at this time, the line segment is now accelerating to 65 knots, and perhaps even, even faster. So a lot happening here. Next, please. <clears throat> this is just a two-panel animation, again, just kind of highlighting that. I think it nicely shows the rear inflow jet um, punching into the back of the system. <clears throat> Note the boundary indicated by the dash line. Um, unfortunately, that boundary didn't continue to raise southward. It sort of, um, sort of maintained itself. Um, um, north of where these QLCSs were, were developing. And note where the, the QLCS uh, tornadic um, circulations were developing, just south of that boundary and generally just north of the apex. Again, this is not a, a, a large corridor. Again, we're talking about 30, 30 nautical miles or so. Next, please. <clears throat> I, uh, well, I, I, I took a chance here and uh, decided to show you a, a SRM cross-section. Um, this is a cross-section basically um, uh, right over the Green Bay radar westward. Um, what I was trying to do is just try to show perhaps that rear inflow jet um, impinging uh, on, on the system. And, and uh, again, I'm not sure what you're seeing here, but you can see that, I think you can see that rear inflow jet uh, punching, uh, punching eastward. Um, during this animation here. Really classic. You can kind of see in the uh, red outbounds there, you can kind of imagine the updraft, downdraft convergence zone on, on the forward flank of that RIJ. Again, going back to uh, Atkins and, and, and St. Laurent, that um, surge that uh, is important in helping to uh, generate rapid uh, mesovortex development and rapid stretching. So I'm just trying to illustrate that in this um, vertical cross-section animation here. So uh, keep in mind here that this cross-section, I think, is probably a little bit north of the, the primary RIJ, and I think it perhaps maybe a little bit, look a little shallower than uh, in reality. If I had taken the cross-section a little bit further south, I think we would have seen a little bit deeper rainfall jet, perhaps. Next, please. <clears throat> Again, now going. Now, think about what we look, I saw in the previous uh, episode one. Here we are again, a little later, uh, slightly further north of that. We see the surging of the bow. Um, I overlaid the zero to three kilometer shear vectors again. Um, you want to look uh, a little bit ahead of the uh, convective line. Note that the uh, magnitudes are around 30 knots, perhaps 35 knots. Again, this is from the wrap. Uh, I looked at the NAM and, and other models, and actually they were a little bit higher than um, what the wrap was showing at this time. But I mean, you get the idea. We're near that 30 knot threshold. I mean, again, that portion of the line that uh, is more normal to those shear vectors, that, that uh, increases the potential for mesovortex uh, genesis. <clears throat> and again, those mesovortices basically formed from basically where that boundary was south to, to near the apex. And I think you can see that clearly uh, in, these two, in these two images. Next, please. Okay, what I thought I'd do now 
is uh, let's look at the initial tornadic mesovortex genesis uh, west of Green Bay. So what you're seeing here now hopefully is a, uh, a loop, but uh, it's a, a all-tilt loop um, showing the, uh, the initial genesis of, of these tornadic mesovortices. Um, again, we're looping from 0 0.5 degrees through 1.3 degrees at 513Z. Again, the first touchdown was, uh, I believe, it was at 522. I don't, I don't recall exactly, but uh, this is shortly before that. The solid circle there indicating MV1, that was the first uh, tornadic mesovortex that evolved. Um, again, this is the first uh, volume scan where uh, we were able to identify clearly. So I kind of consider this the, the genesis time. To the south of there, you see some, a couple areas of weak shear um, that are evolving along that updraft, downdraft con conversion zone. And if you look in the left hand, that's okay, John, you can stay there. Um, going on to, okay, where, where are we at? <laughs> Here at 517, okay, very good. Um, in one volume scan, um, we see very rapid evolution continuing. MV1 is strengthened. Uh, considerably. You, you can pretty much see a gate-to-gate -gate, um, signature there with MV1, but even more importantly, um, in one volume scan, all of a sudden there's MV2 rapidly developed. And note the location of that, that is very close to that outflow boundary that I talked about earlier. And again, there's some, some weaker circulations uh, indicated by the dash lines there, dash circles. Those are weak, weaker circulations. Actually, a couple of those, based on the damage survey, were uh, produced some uh, generally weak straight line wind damage. So there was some wind damage with those, but as far as we are aware, based on our survey, those, those, were, not, those were not tornadic. They were weaker, they were shallower, uh, certainly more so than MV1 and MV2 uh, to the north. Next, please. Hey, Gene, one thing I noticed, um, yeah. we've kind of seen it here too, is, is the uh, circulations will often appear strongest at slightly higher elevation slices, you know, so you'll actually get sort of a descending type of uh, mode to the circulation, which, you know, which is a little surprising. You'd, you'd expect it to start, you know, at the very lowest slice and then work its way up. But, you know, I was reading um, Weissman and Trapp have done some simulations, and they, and they you know, they actually kind of confirm this, that, you know, very often your, your strongest circulation is going to start um, a little, little higher up and then, you know, kind of cascade both up and down. So, so this does actually give you um, a little heads up if you're if you're willing to look at not just the 0.5 but you know the 0.9 and the 1.3 as well. Was that true for day and night or just nocturnal? That was uh, the ones I looked at were non nocturnal. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was for uh, for day. I'm honestly not sure. I don't remember them saying anything in the simulations about it being you know diurnally dependent. However. Um, this is this is Ron here in St. Louis. I agree with you very much on that. Um, I'm looking at a lot of these vortices initially forming about between the one to two kilometer layer. That's a good location where they initially form, and they do build from that layer up and downward. Basically, I agree with that very much. And Ron, did you see a darnel trend to those? Um, most of my cases in the afternoon or the evening hours. I don't have many nocturnal cases. So most of the events I've been looking at have been, like, say, between 3 o'clock all the way up to about maybe 8 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock at night, something like that. So, um, Excellent comments, and that is exactly what we observed here, that uh, the, the, the strongest circulations they were more apparent, the, the vortices were more apparent um, initially above 0 0.5 degrees, again, in that 0 0.9 to 1.3. Um, so that's exactly what we observed as well. And um, again, talking to the warning decision maker on this evening, he was focused on the 0 0.5. And he was thinking more straight line wind damage. You know, he was focused on the rear inflow jet, uh, you know, uh, focused on that, um, and really wasn't uh, interrogating you know, the vertical structure uh, perhaps as, as thoroughly as, as he could. But I will make the point that um, um, you know, these, this was evolving so rapidly and accelerating rapidly uh, moving eastward so quickly, he was really more concerned about just getting the warning off of the downstream counties. Um, he just didn't have really time to interrogate these thoroughly. Again, he's the only warning decision maker looking at this aspect uh, of the event. We had the other warning decision maker focused on the uh, weaker storms to the north. So we were kind of in a little bit of a bind, bind here in that regard. Just The evolution was just so fast, so rapid, um, just really weren't able to interrogate these vertically uh, as thoroughly as we could. But the point I'm making here is the evolution is extremely rapid here. 
Dean, this Excellent. is Jason in Springfield. Can I make one more comment? Sure. Uh, I just want to clarify that uh, using the word uh, descending may be a little bit um, confusing. This isn't descending in terms of supercell descending, where you've got a mid-level mesocyclone, and uh, you, you see that gradually descend down uh, towards LCL level. Uh, one thing, though, uh, you talk about looking at a little bit higher tilts, especially as you get closer to the RDA. Uh, LCL level seems like a good place to start. That's all I got. You mean okay, to look thanks, for the Jason. first rotation? Uh, great point as well. Next, please. I'm okay, sorry. so I'm going to have to take a little time to explain this. Um, uh, so let me do that. Um, basically, if you look in the upper left four panel there, uh, I'm looking at uh, on the 0522 time period. Um, basically, the, the the time period when those uh, initial tor tornadoes uh, were were on the ground or, or about on the ground. Obviously, you can see in the CC uh, image on the lower left there, there is a debris signature there, and I'll talk about that more later. But this is uh, you know very early on with with MV1 and 2 um, um, either tornadic or about to become tornadic. And then on the right is the next volume scan at 0527. Um, so I'm, I'm referring to, to those two mesovortices um, uh, in the uh, time sections on the right. And, and let me explain those. Now, these are those classic um, time height um, sections that Ron has done and others have done uh, when analyzing and trying to analyze the uh, evolution and structure of these uh, mesovortices. So I, I took the same approach, and basically what we're seeing here, uh, let's just look at the upper right-hand one. Um, we're looking at height on uh, kilometers uh, vertically, and then you know, on the x-axis, we're looking at time elapsed from genesis. And the star there indicates the first volume scan where we were able to identify um, the initial uh, mesovortex. So I consider that the genesis time. As you go to the right, that's um, uh, each volume scan after initial genesis. And the contours are basically VR shear in meters per second. Um, the grayish, or uh, I don't know what to call them, uh, circles there uh, represent the max TDS tornado debris signature. We assume there are tornado debris signatures here um, at that volume scan. And what's plotted there on the trace is the height, uh, the maximum height. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be using this type of presentation just uh, as I go through some of the other, other mesovortices that evolved here. So if you look at MV1, um, now this, if you look at it, sort of implies uh, perhaps some descending characteristics, but I say that with extreme caution because this MV was furthest away from the radar. It was probably around 40 nautical miles or so from the radar. So um, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not certain that this had any descending characteristics or not. It implies that here, but um, you know, we're not looking at a lot of volume scans uh, here. So take that with a grain of salt. The other MVs that evolved later certainly had classic non-descending characteristics. And you can see that in MV2 below. That was the second mesovortex that developed near the boundary. This is much more classic of what you'd expect to see in these type of rapidly evolving uh, events. You can see how the uh, velocities increase rapidly at, at pretty much all elevations um, below 3.5 kilometers or so. Again, um, in, in these two M initial MVs, it appeared that the tornado uh, debris signature appeared about two volume scans after initial genesis, um, which, which I thought was somewhat interesting. And you can see the debris signature, the depth, and the, at least in these two events, um, debris signature grows in depth um, as the mesovortex continues to strengthen um, particularly in MV2 there. V very interesting. Um, uh, and then, uh, in the next couple volume scans, these, these mesovortices merge. And you can see that in the 527 scan in the upper right four panel there. I have that in the dashed circles. Um, those are those two mesovortices uh, beginning to merge uh, at this time. And they weren't nearly as impressive uh, during the merger, at least from a velocity perspective, at least at this elevation, which I, I think was 0.9. Um, but clearly, you look below at the uh, uh, CC um, dual pole data, two very nice um, debris signatures uh, are, are apparent at this time. Maximum initial TDS height with, with uh, MV1 was around 2 kilometers. Uh, MV2 at initial max height was uh, very low. So obviously, that one had just apparently had just 
occurred. It just touched down, uh, I'm assuming. A max TDS heights observed with these two were anywhere from two to three and a half kilometers or so. So anyway, next please. Here's MV4. This is really classic, uh, more classic of the non-descending nature of these that uh, Ron and others have, have talked about for, for quite a long time. Uh, again, note that you go from left to right in the uh, uh, trace on the upper right-hand uh, part of the slide there. A very rapid uh, vortex uh, strengthening at all levels, but note where the max uh, rotation is occurring around um, 1834 there um, on the right-hand side. Uh, that is generally below one and a, one and a half kilometers where the max uh, rotation is occurring. And, and you were talking about earlier where we're seeing where these are, are, are initially uh, developing. This sort of suggests that same thing, that the, the vortex is, is, is developing in that uh, oh, one and a half kilometer, one kilometer uh, elevation. Also note, uh, I thought was interesting, at least in this event from what we could tell, the time of the TDS, the first TDS uh, occurs one volume scan after initial MV genesis in this case. So um, one volume scan after we identify it, wham, there's a TDS uh, signature already up there uh, at around one kilometer or so. Very interesting. Next, please. This is uh, the next missile vortex uh, that evolved. This one I thought was uh, one of the more, most impressive ones. Um, this one appeared to develop, uh, this developed north of, of MV2 and MV4 that I talked about. Again, this one is very close, if not on, that thunderstorm outflow boundary that I, I talked about earlier. Again, if you look at the VR trace in the upper left, um, very, very rapid um, vortex strengthening uh, through, a, through a depth of at least three and a half, four kilometers there. Note, after one volume scan, after MV genesis, there's a TDS up to close to two and a half kilometers. Now, I note there that the TDS appears to descend. I, I, I don't under, quite understand why that's occurring. Um, I'm not even about to explain what might be happening there. Um, again, I should mention that identifying these TDSs this close to the radar, um, also TDSs that were very close together um, uh, was somewhat challenging. So uh, it, um, I wouldn't read too much into that, but note, though, that after one volume scan, um, TDS uh, through a very uh, great height, again, indicating rapid vortex stretching, I think, in this case. Very impressive. Next, please. This is MV6. This was the last one that uh, affected our CWA. This was just east of Green Bay, about, oh, 15 nautical miles east of the radar. Again, illustrating pretty much classic um, non-descending characteristics. Note the, the, str the strongest circulation below one and a half kilometers. Again, after one volume scan, um, they were TD, TDS appearing, uh, in this case at about a little over a half kilometer, and then uh, with time that TDS uh, depth increased. Probably more perhaps what you might expect. This one I think was probably the closest one to the radar uh, as well. Um, if you look at the CC signature in the lower right, um, um, I think it's fairly clear. That is something we didn't see initially after we we uh, looked at this event the very next day, and uh, Jeff had already gone out and, and done a dam started his damage surveys to the south. I was going back and looking at the data a little closer, and I had not noted the, noticed this at first. Um, so the next day, we saw this. Um, we, did, we called the counties. They said they had no reports of damage. We called the EM, Sheriff's Department, whatever, nothing. But on a, you know, based on what we saw here, we went ahead and did another survey the next day, and sure enough, um, we, we noted uh, a narrow swath of damage um, in that area southwest of Pilsen. So the dual pole, great example of how it helped us uh, identify these, these uh, relatively localized uh, narrow damage paths. Next, please. OK, this is another four panel animation. I'm just going to let it load here. Um, I wanted to show this because I think it sort of illustrates that ingredient three that Jason and Ron talk about in terms of uh, you know, the surge. Um, impinging on the uh, forward flank of, of, a, of, a, of this type of system. Um, so hopefully it's loaded and you can, you can kind of see what, what I'm trying to show here. The upper left hand is reflectivity, uh, 0 0.9, and the upper right is uh, SRM at 0 0.9, and the base velocity at 0 0.9 in the lower left, and then the CC dual pull product in the, in the lower right. And that white line there sort of denotes what I, I 
kind of identified as a leading edge of look like a velocity surge, kind of enhanced inbounds um, impinging on the front end. And if you kind of watch that uh, with time, uh, you kind of see as it approaches uh, the, um, the leading edge, bam, um, you see a, a rapid a development of a mesovortex. That's MV5. That was one of the most impressive ones that uh, we noted in the, in the time height sections. So I thought this sort of illustrated that, that uh, gradient three that, uh, that uh, Jason and Ron uh, discuss in their paper. Note two, this again is, um, this is evolving very close to, if not on, that east-west boundary. Hey, Gene, can I just make yes. a quick comment on this? Sure. Yeah, I was just going to say also, look at the new cell growth occurring on the leading edge there, too. So you've got multi-cell evolution going on in this particular event quite nicely. So this one, so the, you know, the reflectivity cores, you get a new cell growth occurring along the forward flank there. Quite nice. And with the old cells, basically, that big cell, we, in the center there, kind of like you just, it was strong and now begins, weakens dramatically. Um, it just kind of weakens dramatically, basically, then descends to the surface and stuff like that. So, OK. So uh, Ron, are you suggesting that um you know, the, this the surge is really more related to a, a collapse, a cell collapse, or is that what we're seeing uh, there? It, it, it could be a combination of both. I mean, it's hard to say right now. You know, it could be a combination of both. I think uh, Mikowski has been working on the cell issue, while Atkins is working on the RHA issue quite a bit. So you know, it's still, you know, it's still a little bit of a discussion back and forth between uh, higher-ups there on this issue, basically. But uh, I would just want to point out the multi-cell evolution along the leading edge here. It's just, you see that collapse occurring on that one big cell. I'm trying to get a closer look at it near, um, oh, geez, uh, right by, what's that town, Gene? Oh, uh, OT. That, that's the Autogamy. Uh, Autogamy, uh, yeah. Yeah, you can see that cell just collapses. It just, boom, it's gone, original cell, and then the new cell growth occurs along the forward flank there. So. There could be some multi-cell, you know, uh, enhancing this particular outflow that's uh, occurring to the east. You know, there's these local surges to the east. And I've seen other cases where just you see the surge so nicely, it just shows up like a sore thumb practically, you know. So. Jason in okay. Springfield, I would kind of concur more towards the uh, multicellular behavior. Um, once you get that uh, acceleration of that surge, you got the enhanced convergence there and new updrafts going on that just kind of get absorbed into the line. And I'm sure as Gene's going to hit here again, that's going to really help your tilting and stretching with the, in, within the balance region. Yep. OK, thanks, guys. Um, next, please. Hey, Gene, so just one to more summarize thing. This. Um, you know, one thing that w we kind of look for here, and admittedly it's not real obvious in that, um, in that animation, but, you know, this was a nighttime event, correct? Yes. OK, so, so we, you know, uh, so we about 12.30 in the morning and about 1.30 in the morning. Okay, and I remember you saying earlier on that you know you were you were kind of worried about things being on a on a downtrend and you know nocturnal inversion forming and everything, right. and you know in those in those situations sometimes in the in the warm sector you'll actually see um, little reflectivity tags kind of racing to the to the northeast rather quickly. You know they they may be like trapped gravity wave type of things. I, I didn't see anything real obvious on this. The only thing that kind of jumped out is, is we were starting to pick up more in the velocity returns, which I think there's a little more sensitivity that, to that than reflectivity. Um, you know, so, so there could be new cell development, but that, could all, but that actually could be related to some of these ripples moving, uh, you know, moving basically northeast ahead of the line. And that can, there's been uh, uh, NUP and some other people have done some research on it where basically if you've got a pre-existing mesovortex, these things can actually can actually stretch it and in intensify it. Uh, now, I'm not totally sure if that's going on here, but it is It is one more thing that we look at. Hey, uh, TJ, hey, T this is Eric uh, across the lake. Hey, how's it going? Good. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the radar data from this event, and there were some tags actually over the Grand Rapids area. And if you draw a line back through the convection, uh, the, uh, the forward flank development that's going up is right uh, in line with those tags over the Grand Rapids area. And uh, you can almost draw a line across the lake. You can see some other uh, weak reflectivity structures, kind of linear, uh, perpendicular to the line, right where the uh, cells are going up. And as the cells collapse, it's kind of on the back end of that wave. So I think what you're talking about there has some, uh, some truth to it. 
Yeah, we've, we've seen it here a lot. Um, so it's definitely something I've been kind of cluing in the forecasters to look at. I mean, it's subtle, and, you know, you always run the danger of, you know, hindsight bias saying, oh, yeah, there was a reflectivity tag there. It was really obvious, you know, that you got to be careful about that. But there are there are cases when it's when it is kind of obvious, and so you can actually get a little lead time on, you know, mesovortex intensification if you've got a pre-existing one and you see one of these, you know, well-defined uh, features racing northeast towards the ahead of the line. So anyway, that's all I had. Thanks. Ron, do you have any comments on that? Because I know you and I talked about the possibility of tags, reflectivity tags in this in this event. Um, do you have any no, comments I do on, on that? I, I, I do concur with TJ and also with Eric on that, too, because I was talking to a forecaster in Indianapolis some time ago. And they mentioned also about these reflectivity tags showing up in front of uh, convective cells, or maybe like the multi-cell evolution. And then, uh, like I see we had they had tunnel genesis occurring too. So there's some going on there. There's no question in my mind. There's some going on there. Only, but at the same token, you know, you got this surge coming out too. I think that's you know, what you know, what kind of follows Atkins' model. Uh, you got this surge coming out basically, which is going to stretch that vortex basically along that leading edge there. So. Uh, I'd say it's, it's still a lot of work to be done. Let's put it this way. So, Okay. Uh, great comments, guys. Thanks. Um, okay. I'm on the slide uh, sort of summarizing some of these observations. I'll just run through these real quickly. Again, uh, the genesis, MV genesis in this case, was occurring on the balance segment of, of the QLCS. And they were uh, definitely anchored to that the leading uh, updraft, downdraft con convergence zone during their lifetime. Um, again, they evolved in a relatively narrow corridor, uh, bounded by the, uh, that outflow boundary I talked about and, and, and roughly the apex, all within about, uh, all evolving within about 40 nautical miles and considerably closer from the Green Bay radar. So we had a pretty good look at, at these uh, in terms of uh, being able to study their evolution. Um, as we just talked about, uh, some of these uh, uh, appear to be associated with uh, RI surges and so on. Um, subsequent mesovortex uh, developed again uh, to the north um, of the uh, initial ones that, that appear to be the case, uh, at least in this event. MV2, 5, and 6 uh, either developed on or just south of the boundary from, from what I could tell from looking at the data. Uh, again, just to reemphasize, they developed extremely rapidly um, in time and vertically. Uh, again, uh, indication of that very rapid uh, growth and, and intense uh, stretching of the vortex too with these. So. Um, and again, classic non-descending characteristics uh, in this case. I should mention, too, in that last bullet, even after the fact, you know, looking at this event time and again uh, with our staff and with Ron and others, I mean, we at times had a hard time following some of the mesovortices from one volume scan to the next. They just evolved very quickly. There would be, you know, uh, mergers going on uh, and so on. So it was, it was very difficult to follow um, due to their speed, rapid ev evolution, and so on. Um, so it was quite challenging, and as I said, even after the fact. So, you know, imagine operationally trying to follow these, uh, you know, it, it's, it's extremely challenging. Next, please. Uh, just a couple other comments, um, just based on our preliminary observations. Um, we noted the max rotational velocity generally occurred at or below one and a half kilometers, and again, um, that, that, that uh, has been seen with many other cases. Um, time from M MV Genesis to the first TDS in this event was around one volume scan. Uh, the, the, the initial two MVs looked like it was closer to two, but as we got the evolutions close to the radar, uh, after one volume scan, there was a TDS there. Um, the TDS was observed in, I think, every case um, before the max uh, rotational velocity was observed with the vortex. I don't know necessarily what that implies, if that means anything, but that was just an observation. The mean maximum rotational velocity um, with, each, with the mesovortices was 26 meters per second. The mean rotational velocity uh, at TDS detection was uh, about 19 meters per second. <clears throat> Again, uh, this is preliminary. I'm not exactly sure what this, what this all would, would, would mean. Average TDS depth was around 2 kilometers. The greatest TDS depth was about 3.5 with MV5. Um, so, uh, again, um, from some uh, studies I've looked at by Schultz, um, who, who looked at some uh, TDS signatures with uh, a variety of convective modes uh, with their supercell structures, um, they were seeing uh, TDS depths up to about 7 kilometers. So these are, you know, roughly half uh, of that, um, at least in this case, it appeared. Uh, and then the max TDS depth 
observed uh, was observed in the same volume scan in which the TDS was first identified. So you had max depth was achieved uh, in the first volume scan. You were able to identify it um, in, in about half the cases. Again, it was challenging trying to identify these TDSs. So let's get back to um, warning decisions and situational awareness. And I just wanted to highlight a couple things here. Um, first of all, in that first bullet, um, as I mentioned earlier, that earlier storm evolution in that episode one that led to that initial mesovortex development uh, east of La Crosse, um, what was overlooked for, for various reasons. Again, the WM just is just coming on, on shift, um, range folding taking place, uh, radar limitations. Um, he wasn't aware of that. Uh, had perhaps uh, he'd been aware of that or had noted that, perhaps it might have given us a, a little more heightened awareness of maybe a potential tornado threat, uh, perhaps. Um, even after the identification of the circulations, um, it was believed that the environment was not really supportive of an enhanced tornado threat. Uh, due to the stability considerations um, and uh, really the lack of understanding of our underlying of the underlying dynamics associated with these, and um, and uh, another uh, point uh, regarding that is talking to Jason and Ron, and that I mean you, you think about this; these things are evolving, you know, at low levels to start with. You know, they're along that updraft downdraft con conversion zone along the leading edge; they're developing in, in low levels uh, initially anyway. So um, you know, it, it, we, we played, we placed too much weight on the on instability, um, and, and that was probably just a reflection of the fact that you know we didn't quite understand the dynamics that were going on here and kind of where these were evolving. Um, so that was an important, I think, lesson learned for us um, in that case. Um, again, I already mentioned the WDM uh, on this case was was uh, you know things were evolving so quickly. Um, didn't have really a lot of time to do vertical interrogation, uh, the evolution of the mesovortices, and was just trying to get the warnings out downstream. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, unfortunately, too much weight was placed on, on uh, storm reports at times. We just weren't getting reports. Matter of fact, we didn't get any reports of any damage until 0530 UTC, which was uh, after we had uh, two D TDSs uh, on the radar which unfortunately we never saw because we never even considered looking at the dual pull data. But, um, you know, this was our, really our second summer. Um, we had virtually no severe weather up to this point. Um, and, um, you know, it just, they just didn't think of looking, looking at the data. And all the cases that I showed our staff uh, in the previous year or so were basically hail cases, um, you know, how the dual pull data could be used to identify hail and so on. Didn't have any you know, showed them a few supercell uh, cases uh, using the dual pole of the TDS signature and so on, um, but didn't really have any uh, QLCS type signatures. Um, so we just weren't, you know, didn't even consider looking at it. But, uh, you know, there were factors involved in that. Um, but believe me, uh, from, you know, from that day forward, uh, you know, we'll be looking at that uh, routinely. And I know some offices, I've talked to some, some uh, uh, Sue's at other offices, they actually have one person de uh, dedicated to looking at the dual pull data, uh, either on a workstation or perhaps in, in GR2. Um, so that's something we may consider as well. Next, please. Um, I just wanted just a few more points on the dual pull data. Again, I'm just kind of going back to the to the. Uh, Kind of the, the early stages of this with the initial MVs, just to kind of, again, just to demonstrate what the dual pull data looked like here at 522. Again, um, you can see we have two circulations there in the upper left in the SRM. And we have one TDS um, <laughs> with the, the, the southern one. That was the initial mesovortex that developed. And on the two lower panels are the two lowest elevation slices, um, 0 0.5 and um, 0 0.9. And just uh, going ahead to the next image, again, um, uh, one volume scan, um, these, these circulations are, look like they're starting to merge, um, yet in the dual pull data in the lower left, uh, clearly two TDS um, signatures are apparent at this point. Based on the damage survey, um, uh, there, were, uh, there were two damage paths at, at this point. And if you look at the 0 0.9, uh, John, if you could just go back briefly. <clears throat> look at 0 0.9 now, um, those, uh, we see sort of a, somewhat uh, broader looking TDS signature, um, uh, suggesting perhaps that these um, signatures either uh, have merged or perhaps we're just seeing uh, what's uh, the residual of the initial TDS with the southern one. I'm not sure, but uh, characteristics look different. If you look at the ZDR 
In the upper right, uh, there were, you know, as you would expect, um, ZDR values were, were near zero. So uh, um, pretty confident uh, you know, this, this met the, the criteria for a, a TDS. <clears throat> Next, please. Um, just one volume scan later, again, just kind of showing the interesting evolution here. Again, we're, with those two initial MVs are, are merging um, here into this sort of redeveloping. And if you look at the TDS, it was a uh, you know, very broad uh, looking signature. Um, you know, is, is this a, based on the damage survey, we still had a, a tornado on the ground uh, based on that survey. Um, we see a much broader signature at this point. Uh, I'm assuming at this point they, they, basically the debris individual signatures sort of merge at this point. Um, you can see that in both the lowest two elevation slices. Again, just interesting um, characteristics in the T TDS uh, signatures. Next, please. Um, just moving on to the next volume scan. Um, based on the damage survey, uh, at this point we did not have a tornado on the ground. Again, you can see um, you know, those uh, initial mesovortices still sort of reorganizing there. And the TDS characteristics are, are, are broad, kind of elongated. Um, you know, uh, again, are we just seeing loft uh, residual from the initial tornadoes, or are we seeing lofted debris, perhaps biomass um, along the leading gust front? I'm not exactly sure, but uh, again, interesting characteristics there. Next, and um, next volume scan, um, rapid uh, mesovortex uh, evolution, and we have a, another tornado uh, quickly forms to the north, and you can see um, the uh, TDS signature there. Um, in this, uh, the thick white circle there in the lower right in particular. Um, that, that developed very quickly, one volume scan there it was. And again, you look to the south, um, much more, uh, uh, I don't know what I want to call it, uh, not as clear TDS signatures. There's actually another tornado just on the north side of that larger circle based on the damage survey. So, um, um, but again, they're kind of embedded in kind of a messy CC. Um, a display there uh, close to the radar. At times it was really difficult to identify these, um, even at 0 0.9 and, and, and higher. Next, please. And finally, at, at 546, um, at this point we had, uh, again, based on the survey, damage survey, we had three tornadoes on the ground here. Um, the one to the north is the most recent uh, mesovortex tornado that, that evolved. And um, you can see uh, uh, somewhat less uh, clear signatures to the south. Again. Uh, um, you know, much, much weaker, uh, not necessarily even meeting the criteria, uh, known criteria for uh, TDS um, uh, dual pole signatures. So we're still looking at this, trying to understand exactly what we're looking at here. Next. Dean, real quick, uh, Jason in Springfield. Uh, yep. One piece of advice is when uh, you're expecting potential mesovortex tornadoes near the radar, the RDA, is uh, disable your CMD. Yeah, yeah, you had mentioned that before. Good point. We did not do that. Okay, well, duly noted. And could you explain why 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 um, that is? Uh, generally speaking, you're just really messy with your your, your CCs, your ZDRs in and close to the RDA. Uh, much cleaner picture if you disable that. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, on this slide again, this sort of just. Sort of a kind of an ugly looking uh, slide, but I just just wanted to show again the evolution of the TDSs in the in the uh, uh, early phases of this. Again, just to showing the various characteristics of the of the signatures. I, I didn't show uh, reflectivity here, but in 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 the uh, in the uh, TDS signatures that we identify in CC and so on, the reflectivity in all cases didn't meet the the threshold of of uh, 30 uh, dBZ. Uh, I just uh, didn't want to. Uh, I have to show that as well. So, again, lots of interesting evolution, trying to distinguish between what may be tornadic uh, signatures and perhaps broader debris, perhaps related to um, uh, straight line winds. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but it's something that I think we'll learn a lot more about over the over the coming years. Next, please. Um, this diagram, um, I just was curious to see how uh, our TDS signatures that we were able to identify compared to some work that the Schultz had done. Um, looking at uh, debris signatures uh, associated with various convective modes, from supercells to QLCS tornadoes and so on. Um, and the colored triangles there uh, represent EF intensity there. The greens and blues are EF0, EF1. Uh, yellows and reds would be the, the strong tornadoes. Uh, I'm assuming many of these are, are, are 
these are these are super cell size. But anyway, if you look at the boxes, uh, those are basically the uh, max TDS heights associated with our event, and you know they're generally similar. Um, you know, we're seeing heights uh, between one and two kilometers. Actually, in this event, um, perhaps uh, the max depths were, were higher than what he uh, noted in, in his study there. Um, but again, um, just, just lots to learn here about uh, you know, what, what we're seeing here in the TDS data and, and what it's telling us. Next, please. <clears throat> so lessons learned, uh, getting to the end here. Um, uh, when M MCS upscale growth and co organizations is expected, um, you know, you got to examine that, look at that zero to three kilometer shear orientation and magnitude. Try to anticipate the updraft downdraft convergence zone orientation as the system evolves with respect to those, those zero to three kilometer shear vectors. So basically overlay those shear vectors on your evolving radar data. Note the orientation. Um, um, this is a good first step. So, you know, as far as we're concerned, if uh, SVC or, we're, or whoever, we're noting cold pool organization, we're starting to think about zero to three kilometer shear. And again, definitely, uh, if you haven't read this paper, uh, consider the three ingredient methodology. And again, I try to address uh, their, their key uh, ingredients uh, in, in this discussion here. And I just summarized some of those, uh, those ingredients there. Um, again, in, in, in this case, we, we really did uh, place uh, too much weight on the uh, convective inhibition. And uh, um, so, uh, you know, if you suspect M MV genesis or, you, you, or you're observing those in the radar data, um, you know, if they're there, they're developing low levels. Um, don't worry about the conve convective inhibition. Talking to Ron and, and Jason, they've looked at several cases where that can range anywhere from maybe uh, convective, inhib convective inhibition of maybe 50 to 250. Um, so uh, you know, we, we, we learned a lot in that respect that, that to just um, you, know, you basically throw that out the window to, to some extent um, when these uh, circulations are evolving. At closer ranges, it's critical that the forecasters uh, are examining elevations above 0 0.5. Um, it'll increase your likelihood of capturing the uh, mesovortex genesis and, and its rapid vertical, vertical growth. Next, please. Um, I threw the slide in here. Um, we didn't do this. Um, again, we didn't have that. We didn't have the staff available. But uh, you know, strongly consider having a warning decision maker, and I would think probably many offices do this, uh, whose solely uh, uh, job is to kind of interrogate the tornado potential. Um, and uh, in, in this case, I'm just showing an example of a polygon. Um, where you might consider, in this case, having a polygon um, uh, stretching from basically uh, including the boundary to the north to perhaps a little south of the apex and, um, you know, have a, issuing a tornado warning uh, encompassing that area. Again, we're only talking about 30 or 40 nautical miles. Um, uh, again, how, you know, I looked at the, uh, the uh, SVW templates uh, on, on AWIPS and, you know, there are, there are um, appropriate um, uh, call to actions and, and things we can use to, to try to address these. Uh, one thing about the polygon I put on here, it's probably not uh, shown for far enough downstream. Again, we're, we're pushing about 70 miles an hour here in uh, propagation, so uh, perhaps the polygon needs to go uh, quite a bit further east. But just an example of how, you know, to be thinking about how are you going to uh, handle these situations in the framework of the S SBW uh, storm-based warning um, methodology. Next, please. Um, for us, um, you know, don't don't let the midnight shift, uh, you know, belly up to the radar uh, as soon as he gets there. Um, Got to give him time to spin up. And that was a uh, procedural uh, mistake um, that uh, you know we, we did there, and I, I don't think that helped in our situational awareness. Um, did, you just didn't give him enough time to really um, get spun up. Um, as far as training, um, I, I have to say that I spent a considerable amount of time uh, last spring talking about. This, this very type of uh, these events. We went over uh, Jason and Ron's paper uh, and so on. Um, we talked about uh, different aspects of that, the zero to three kilometer shear. The problem was I did that in the spring and uh, we never really did address it again for the, for the remainder of the summer. So three months go by, um, you know, we're, we're people on leave coming and going. We've had almost no severe weather. Event like, event like this hits and, and you know, we, we just were caught off guard. So for me, as a Sioux here, um, certainly, um, you know, I want to, you know, kind of drag that training out a little bit more into the season and provide little short little training um, scenarios to kind of keep people sharp. You know, if you're in a northern office, um, 
That's really critical. And as far as damage surveys, um, uh, I know this is hard to do. You know, resources and time are all factors. But uh, one thing we're going to try to do do here is, um, you know, if we have the time and resources, uh, even if there's been no damage reports, if we see fairly decent mesovortices on the radar, um, uh, we're going to try to get out there and do some damage surveys to see if, in fact, there were, was some damage there. That would certainly help the science um, get a better understanding of, uh, you know, which one of these are producing tornadoes and which aren't. Um, in that regard, I just wanted to note there, too, that that last tornado, MV6, um, as I said, we had no reports of, of damage of that, um, but the TDS data was invaluable in, in helping us identify uh, the potential area of damage. And sure enough, we went out there the next day and, and we, we discovered a, a tornado path there. Next, please. Uh, just to kind of... Uh, acknowledgments to, to, to various staff um, at Green Bay, Mike and Ashley, Scott and Ed uh, from Milwaukee, all were uh, invaluable in helping us do the analysis um, for this case. We've still got a lot of work to do. Ron and Jason Schumann uh, have been invaluable. They've been working with us uh, right from the get-go. matter of fact, the day after the event, uh, I was on the phone with Ron and we were talking about it. Um, and they've been invaluable in, in helping us uh, study this event and learn from it. And, and, and it, we can't ap we appreciate very much the time um, uh, they spent with us. And, and they have a lot of information. There's a lot of things we can learn there. And again, if you start with their, their uh, 2012 paper there, um, uh, there, there's a lot of great information that uh, perhaps help us better anticipate these uh, and so on. So anyway, with that, um, I am finally finished, if anyone is still there. Thank you very much. Hey, Gene. Yeah. Matt of Paducah. Yeah. Um, this looks very similar to our cool season QLCSs that we've been studying down here. Um, I'd be interested to find out what your maximum visa bar was prior or at tornado touchdown. What we're finding in our cool season events, again, this matches pretty well, we're finding that uh, uh, visa bar to really look for and warn on is just above 30 knots or, you know, a little over 15 meters per second. I think in our case the... Uh Average uh, rotational velocity uh, was around minus, uh, was about 19 meters per second. Now uh, you notice I didn't talk about the the tornado touchdown. I, I, I kind of referred to uh, uh, the uh, TDS signature because you know basically no one observed a tornado. Um, uh, you know really are the, the the initial times of touchdown is very difficult to determine. Um, even from the damage surveys, um, you know, no one saw them. Um, no one had a clock that stopped that said, well, this is when it hit. So, um, you know, quite frankly, these, these initial start times are based on, you know, heavily on the radar data. So I, I, I used the, the TDS signature to try to give me an indication of approximately when perhaps the tornado had, had touched down, used that as sort of the, the initial time. But, um, you know, I'm open to suggestions on that one. Well, didn't, uh, Gene, didn't the damage survey show where that initial touchdown was located? It, it, it did where, where it occurred, but the exact time um, it was... It relates to the uh, radar. Yeah, it relates right yes. to the radar and stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, earlier we were talking about the uh, mesovortex um, descending, and then I heard... Well, I was just questioning. I heard something about the LCL level. Uh, did someone suggest that the LCL level was the first place to look for the strongest rotation initially? Is that what they were saying? Yeah, that was Jason. That's Jason in Springfield. Yeah, just just an initial place to look. The, the main theme there is if you're close to the RDA, don't just be looking at the .5. It, it just seems like these signatures show up a little bit stronger, uh, a little bit higher up cl cl towards your cloud base. and. Um, also, going back to the work of many, all the way back through TRAP, um, typical genesis level for these mesovortices going to be anywhere from a, a averaging around a kilometer, but there's many documented mesovortices that are a little bit below there for starting genesis point, and then all the way up to 1.5 and, and 2 kilometers. So it's just something we kind of use as a rule of thumb around here, but it, uh, don't, don't take that verbatim, just a starting point. Thank you. Yeah, Gene, this is uh, Scott in uh, Goodland, yeah, and Scott, uh, Scott. I just wanted to thank you, man. Uh, you know, a lot of times in our agency we have uh, 
kind of a reluctance to go back and learn from our mistakes and from our performances that may not have gone the way we wanted it. And uh, it really does give us a good learning laboratory. And, and some of the dialogue I've heard today has just been great. So I just want to thank you. It takes a lot of courage to do this. And uh, I think we need more of this. So, so thanks for doing this. You bet. I really enjoyed it. Uh, again, we learned a ton. Um, and uh, you know, in, in some respects, we're glad it happened because the knowledge we've gained in, over the last six months has, has been tremendous. That's it. That's all I have. Okay. Well, thank you, Gene, uh, for your presentation today. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next.